How you doing, buddy? <clears throat> okay. You can see me? All right. The light's bad, huh? But that's the, the, that's the best I can do. Sorry. I hope the lighting doesn't bother you guys. Let's see. Yeah. All right. Should be good. All right. What's happening, friend? What's happening? Can you hear me? Just let me know if you can hear me. Okay. Well, I'm just waiting for someone. Guess who I'm waiting for again, Protestant believer? He should show up. What's going on, Niles guy? What's up? Hey, Knight. Welcome. Pray. The Spirit fills me to glorify Jesus Christ. I'm waiting for this guy, Mark Cyril. The dude is like a rabid dog. Doesn't stop. And so now I'm going to use him as a guinea pig and as another test study to show you how not to interpret scripture. Uh, the guy's arrogant that he actually thinks he wrote a refutation, right? To my claim that animals have souls and spirits. <clears throat> but watch what I'm do to him because he kept calling me a coward. So, guys, <clears throat> viewer discretion advised. I'm not going to be nice to him. So I'm here. The lighting is too bright, so I have to be like this from this angle. You guys okay with that? So we're just waiting for him to show up. If not, we'll talk about other issues. Yep. What's happening, everyone? Welcome. Hopefully Rice is that. Uh, this is actually cherry limeade, man. I just got introduced to it here in Colorado. And man, it's delicious. It's zero carbs, zero sugar. It's just water, flavored water. God bless you too, Christopher Moses. So we'll wait for him to show up. Anata, because he posted a long rant, and I thought I made it clear. You don't post long rants in the comments section because I'll block you. But he thinks that I blocked him because his arguments were so solid. right? And they're the most pathetic argumentation this is why james 3 1 netta warns that not every one of us should presume to be teachers because we'll be judged more strictly and he's going to be a case study yeah he's a joke but because he keeps barking i'm gonna muzzle him and i'm again guys forgive me for being blunt in your face not politically correct and not nice right when you call me a coward because you think you know scripture i'm not gonna be nice i'm not those typical christians where i'm gonna be nice right May the Lord Jesus save me from my own imperfections in my flesh, crucify my flesh, fill me with the power and the life and the fruit of the Holy Spirit to be like Jesus Christ in love and compassion and patience and gentleness, but in boldness and fearlessness as well, right? Because Christ is the perfect combination. So in the meantime, as that's why I didn't title it Seeing God. If he doesn't show up, we'll talk about that, right? If he doesn't show up, we'll talk about that, whether you can see God the Father or not. It's amazing how these topics draw in very, very animated agents of Satan, right? I mean, have you noticed in the last several streams, the people that have come in, distracted, attacked, mocked, blasphemed, and then I spent about 50 minutes and I say this, I don't want to come off arrogant. May the Lord Jesus crucify my flesh, destroy my pride, honestly, right? But we had to educate in school our friend James Snap, who didn't want to let go because out of his pride and arrogance, he had to get in the last word and prove his point. So we'll see if this gentleman shows up. I just emailed him. I sent him several emails, so hopefully he'll show up. All right. Let's see. If not, we'll, we'll talk about things other than him. Okay. All right. We're working slowly to get a thousand. If David Wood, Hater Wood can get a thousand, I can get a thousand by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Uh, I am actually open to either position. I'm open to old earth creationism and young earth creationism. I'm open to both. I do think there are stronger arguments exegetically for young earth, right? Not because of the Yom argument, but because of the fact that up until 
the time of the flood, neither animals nor humans ate flesh. It was only after the flood that God permitted human beings to eat flesh. And where you see that God put fear and dread in the hearts of animals towards humans, right? Jeremiah 15, 16, you're talking to the wrong gentleman. And I don't want to talk about him because I don't want to do what he does with his show. He turns his dividing line into a bashing session. Okay. But you're going to have to pray for him and ask him to learn how to treat other brothers and sisters in Christ with respect and decency. And so <clears throat> for him to cry foul or play victim when I give him a taste of his own med medicine shows he is a hypocrite. And may the Lord Jesus grant him genuine repentance you know, for the glory of Christ, right? So you're talking to the wrong guy. In fact, here, because you mentioned him, and I don't want to talk about him, but I'm going to briefly challenge you on this. Here's my challenge to you, Jeremiah, okay? Here's my challenge. Guys, I'm going to challenge every one of you. Who's going to take me up on this challenge? Are you ready? Here's my challenge. Are you ready to take me up on the challenge? You guys, tell me if you're ready to take me up on the challenge. Tell me if you're ready. I want you to go back and listen to the previous dividing lines for the last year. Okay. Can you guys do me this favor? Start watching the dividing lines that James White has done for the last year. Come back to me and tell me if there is a dividing line that he hasn't bashed, criticized, attacked, mocked in the most ungracious manner. Fellow Christian brothers and sisters whom God is using mightily, men of integrity are not compromising, not compromising, right? <clears throat> if you can point to a show where he hasn't done that, I'll publicly apologize to every one of you. Guy Wilker Wilkerson, you know you have to leave now, right? Because I'm answering a question and you're saying, oh, no, please not again. You have to leave. You know that, my friend, right? You got to leave. You know that. Sorry, bro, but this not for you. This this YouTube channel and me, I'm not for you. Go find someone else. Well, keep praying. I got 50 more pounds to go. By the grace of God, keep it up. We'll keep it off and get my health back and holiness. Okay, but Jeremiah, you, I want you to take me up on that challenge. You brought it up. Okay. Okay, so Guy Wilkerson, why are you criticizing me? Oh, no, not again, and attacking me, brother. I'm answering the question of Jeremiah 15, 16. Pray for me by the power of the Holy Spirit that I live up to this promise. I'm not going to turn my YouTube channel into a bashing session where I bash brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing mighty work for the glory of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit unless it's absolutely necessary that I have to bring out a specific point that someone bring, mentions or does that I think is very bad. Okay. All right. Well, our friend is not here. Our friend is not here. Ro Rocio, I used to be a five-point Calvinist, but the more I meditated on the Word of God, the deeper I reflected on specific passages of Scripture, the more I agonized over what the Bible teaches as a whole, I can no longer say I'm a five-point Calvinist. Right. I can no longer say that. And that's just my own personal journey, my own personal conviction. I used to be at one time, and I introduced a group of my friends locally in Chicago to the doctrines of grace, the five points of Calvinism. And many of them are staunch five-point Calvinists. Some of them are very hyper-Calvinists, and they're not very happy that I've walked away from Calvinism, and I don't use the moniker. What I like to use is the term biblicist. I'm trying to be as biblical as possible. So if there's something that comports with Arminian theology, in other words, if there is a teaching in Arminian theology that is fully backed up by scripture, I'll accept it. If there's a teaching that contradicts a specific, a specific aspect of Arminian theology, I'll reject that. Same thing with Calvinism. Even when it comes to the doctrine of communion saints, there are Protestants who've been shocked 
that I as a Protestant who affirms sola scriptura and sola fide can embrace the communion of saints because I see overwhelming biblical support for it to the chagrin of many Protestants who have now attacked me and questioned my salvation because I want to be a biblicist. So if there is a teaching in the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church that is fully scriptural, meaning completely backed up by scripture, that I'm going to embrace it and accept it by the grace of God's Holy Spirit. Because I want to accept all that the Bible teaches. I really do. There are a lot of things that I believe that I'm an error of, but I'm not aware that I'm an error. And my prayer is the Holy Spirit will convict me and make me aware in what areas of theology am I mistaken and give me the grace to be humble, to correct myself, and then give me the power to live the truth of God passionately, to, be in pa to passionately love Jesus Christ and love my brothers and sisters for the sake of Jesus Christ. So that's my journey, right? That's my journey. That's why I am very open to hearing from a variety of Christian voices. Stephen Baptist, even as a Calvinist, you don't have assurance of salvation. You want me to prove that to you? Can I prove that to you? And we're going to begin in prayer and begin. Can I prove to you that even as a Baptist, you don't have assurance of salvation? I'm sorry, not a Baptist. I'm going by your name. I apologize. I meant as a Calvinist. You don't have? Okay. In Calvinism, the elect whom God has predestined for salvation, whom he will definitely regenerate, regenerate and preserve by his Holy Spirit, they will be glorified. But here's the question. Who among the Calvinists can tell you with absolute certainty that they are one of the elect that God has chosen, and so that as an individual, they have absolute certainty that they will never fall away and that God will preserve them forever because they know with absolute certainty they are of the elect. Name me one Calvinist who can tell you he or she is absolutely certain they are of the elect. And therefore, they know with absolute certainty the Holy Spirit will preserve them forever and they'll never fall away. In fact, don't Calvinists tell you that when someone who's a Calvinist who falls away and never returns, that he was never truly born again? He was never truly of the elect? He was never one of us? Because if he was one of us, then he'd remain, but his falling away shows that he never belonged to us, citing 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Right? Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, again, you don't need me. I need you. They don't need me. They need you. We need Jesus. We need your Holy Spirit. Father, I ask that you forgive us and forgive me. Please help us, Father, to crucify our flesh, to die to the flesh and walk in the life and the power and the victory of your Holy Spirit, covered and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Help me, Father, to crucify my carnal passions. Give me victory over impatience and unrighteous anger. Give me self-control and self-discipline, Father, for the glory of Jesus, so I don't shame the Lord Jesus. And fill us with the Holy Spirit. Fill everyone here with the Holy Spirit. Fill our loved ones with the Holy Spirit. Fill my daughters with the Holy Spirit. Cover them and wash them in the blood of Jesus. Please, Abba. Avinu, Abba, please, in Jesus' name. Bless our, our loved ones, our, our families. Bless us, Father. Anoint the sound of my voice to speak truth without error. Save me from stammering, confusion. Save me from sinning and grieving your spirit. Grant me clarity of thought and speech and recall of the passages, Father, to glorify Jesus Christ, to magnify Jesus Christ, your very heart to us that Jesus will increase in us and we will decrease, Father. Give us wisdom and illumination, understanding from your spirit to know your word with greater depth and clarity and live it out more perfectly and powerfully, Father, to be doers of your word so that Jesus Christ will delight in us and be revealed through us. Please, Father, we love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And Lord, grant me the health I need to do this for your glory, as long as you're pleased to use me for your glory. And save us from attacks of the enemy and distractions, Father. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. They're here because of you, Father. And increase the channel, not for fame or fortune, so that more people will hear this word, as long as you're pleased to use me to share the word for the glory of Christ. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yehovah.
Amen. Yeah, how about Father says. Sheep work, I have no idea what you're talking about because that's one of the most pathetic arguments you can use to try to refute the divine personhood of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is identified with personal characteristics in contexts where other persons, individuals are involved. So are you trying to attack my belief in the divine person of the Holy Spirit? You're going to embarrass yourself, right? Is that what you're doing? Because the divine person of the Holy Spirit is affirmed in the entire breadth of scripture and all the different literary genres of scripture not just poetic books where you use personification hyperbole simile but also in historical narrative and didactic portions of scripture it's found throughout the entire breadth of scripture so you cannot simply explain it away as personification right so i don't know what you're asking me are you asking me how to refute that or you're using that to refute right Yes, we know that, James Knapp. You know, I love you, brother, but for some reason you feel the need to simply repeat what I said. Th that's what I said. They said the elect who are born of the Spirit, predestined by God, will truly be preserved forever and ever. But they, as an individual, do not know with absolute certainty that they are part of the elect. They have confidence. They, they trust in the Lord that they are, but they do not have absolute cer certainty, right? I don't even think I'm a four-point Calvinist anymore. It depends on my mood and attitude for the day. <clears throat> sometimes I wake up a Calvinist. Sometimes I wake up an Arminian. Sometimes I wake up an Orthodox. Sometimes I wake up Catholic. Sometimes I wake up Calvinian. Right? Sometimes <clears throat> um, historic pre-mill. Then sometimes I'm a pan-mill. Everything will eventually pan out. Anyway, just kidding. All right. Okay. Our friend Mark Cyril didn't show up, and lucky for him, because, again, <clears throat> as you guys know, I'm not politically correct. I would have really went after him for calling me a coward and for perverting scriptures the way he did, right? Yeah, yeah, he, he keeps uh, pestering me on emails, calling me a coward, because of his pathetic butchering of scripture where he tries to explain away the arguments I presented. And I said, show up. We'll go point by point, and by the grace of God, decimate your shameless butchering of Scripture. See, when you call me a coward, then the gloves are off. I can't be nice to you. <clears throat> yes, that's why I enjoy these, because zero carbs, zero sugar. It's water that's flavored, completely healthy. <clears throat> of course they do, Star Pharaohs. What's the proof that you have a sinful nature? Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 26. <clears throat> we won't read it, but I want you to read it. Those who are born of the Spirit now <clears throat> are experiencing warfare. Your flesh, meaning that sinful tendency, inclination that resides in your flesh, is at war with the Holy Spirit in you. And so Paul says, continue to walk in the life and power of the Holy Spirit so that you can crucify the passions of the flesh and die to them. And become stronger against your fleshly desires. And do not succumb to them. So there's a war going on. Galatians 5, 16 to 26. Right. Anyway, sheep, let me show you examples in which the Holy Spirit is identified as a person. Meaning <clears throat> personal traits are attributed to him in context where other individuals or persons are involved showing that you can't explain this away as personification. Are you interested in that? And we'll talk about passages, says in John 1.18. Do those passages teach that God cannot appear in visible form, meaning the Father? When I say God, when I use the term God in an unqualified sense, I mean the Father, right? You guys understand what I mean. When I use the term God without qualification, in an unqualified sense, I mean the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because that's even the pattern in the New Testament. In the New Testament, as Holy Spirit fills me to speak accurately for the glory of Christ, God is most often used in reference to the Father so that if you read a passage where the term God appears, assume it's referring to the Father unless the context suggests otherwise, right? <clears throat> Something similar takes place with the term Lord, Kyrios or Kurios. The New Testament most often uses the term Lord 
Kyrios, or if you want to pronounce it the Rasmian way, Kurios, for the Lord Jesus Christ. So that you assume when the term Lord is used, it's referring to Jesus unless the context suggests otherwise. It's interesting, right? The New Testament writers, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, use two different divine titles in reference to two different divine persons. They use the term God most frequently for the Father to denote the fact that he is God Almighty, the only true God. But they also use the term Lord most frequently in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ to show that he is Yahovah or Jehovah, Yahweh of the Old Testament who became flesh. Because they don't simply use the term Lord in reference to Jesus in the sense of that Jesus is our master or our sovereign ruler or king. They use it in the sense of him being the God of the Old Testament, Yahovah or Yahweh, as some people like to pronounce it. Is everyone with me? Or am I confusing you guys? Because I want to speak clearly and accurately and repeat the same point so that you can understand the scriptures with greater clarity for the glory of Christ. Guys, don't get into side talks and debates. Focus because I want you to learn. No, I don't think I would. I don't think I would do an entire exposition of the book of Revelation because Revelation, there's a blessing and a curse, right? A blessing and a curse. A blessing to read it and understand it and apply it, but a curse if you misinterpret it. And I, I don't want to add to any more curses in my life. I don't want any more discipline in my life because I already have sins I struggle with that I have to give an account for. So I'm begging the Lord Jesus for his mercy and to cleanse me in his precious blood, right? Okay, so that's, I, that's why I would hesitate. Amen. All right, let's talk about the Holy Spirit clearly being depicted as a person. Let's go to John 15, 26 to 27. Let's look at that, and we're going to then segue into Father. I like James Knapp's analogies. Perhaps one might think of Calvinism as a sort of model, like tinker toy molecules. Not strictly accurate, but convenient way of picturing how scripture statements about salvation fit together. Yes, yeah, so I'm assuming that you're more Calvinistic in your soteriology. John 15, 26, 27. But when the comforters come, guys, pay attention. Here are some of the passages that demonstrate the Holy Spirit is a person, albeit a divine person. He's not a human person or an angelic person. He's a divine person, one with the Father and the Son. Let me show you how to use these passages to demonstrate that even to folks like Joe's witnesses. So read with me. But when the comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He shall testify me. Persons testify and bear witness, not inactive, not inactive, I'm sorry, active forces. They won't say inactive. They'd say active forces. Energies, forces do not testify. Persons do. But to prove that the Holy Spirit is a person who testifies, who bears witness, notice verse 27. Notice verse 27. And ye also shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Notice the Holy Spirit and the apostles will bear witness and testify about Jesus Christ. Now, would a Jehovah Witness deny that the apostles are persons? They have personhood, personalities. Would anyone deny that? So then how can they deny the person of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit bears witness in the same context that other persons do? Sheep, you're not listening to me. And I think I'm going to have to block you too because you're now exposing yourself because you're not listening. Did you hear what I just said? How do you have a power bearing witness in the same context where persons are bearing witness alongside the Holy Spirit. Are you listening, sheep? Or are you pretending to be listening so I can send you on your merry way? Okay, Sheep, I'm going to end up blocking Idiotai because Idiotai is not respecting the rules when I said do not engage in side talk so that people won't be distracted. So even Idiotai wants to get blocked, right? See, this is why I say, guys, focus. So I'm trying to be a taskmaster. I want you to focus so you can learn. All right? So that's one example. Acts 5.32. No, IMAX, did you read the passages? The Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father will testify about Christ, and so will the apostles. It's in the same context. So contextually, exegetically, you cannot say 
that the Holy Spirit is not a person simply because he testifies, because he's bearing witness in the same context that other persons bear witness to Christ. Since no one's going to deny contextually that the apostles are persons who bear witness, what grounds can you deny that for the Holy Spirit? The only difference is the Holy Spirit is not a human person. He's a divine person. You see the point? Okay. Acts 5.32. Acts 5.32. Read with me and learn, benefit, and use it for the glory of Christ. Acts 5.32. And we are his witnesses of these things. Peter speaking. We are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit. Hold on. This guy here again. He's, he's now commenting on my page. See? What a, what a wicked dog. Hold on. Okay, let's see if he shows up. And I wonder why I don't have respect for these dogs and why I call them dogs. Hopefully he's here. Yep. The coward does and goes and put comments on my page because he doesn't want to come here and defend his trash. Anyway, Acts 5.32. Let's see if he shows up. If not, then I'm going to block him. Yeah, well, find him because he's a coward, because he understands he's a son of Satan. He can't defend his perversion of Scripture. Acts 5.32, and we are as witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey. Now, sheep, pay attention. Peter saying, we are witnesses, as is the Holy Ghost. On what grounds contextually are you going to say the Holy Spirit is not a person who bears witness when he's bearing witness alongside other persons who do? Along other persons who do. You get my point? Okay. Acts 5, verses 3 to 4. Acts 5, verses 3 to 4. It's okay. I'm going to block him if he doesn't show up. But Peter said, Ananias, now pay attention here to the context. Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? So notice, Peter's saying, Ananias lied to the Holy Ghost. And to keep back part of the price of the land. While whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Okay, folks, no one's going to deny that when Ananias lied to the men, the apostles, he was lying to persons. No one's going to deny that when Ananias lied to God, he was lying to a person, albeit a divine person. But in that same chapter, it says he lied to the Holy Spirit. So on what grounds are you going to say that lying to the apostles, men, shows that they're persons. Lying to God shows that he's a person. But lying to the Holy Spirit shows he's an active force and not a person. Contextually, ex exegetically, how are you going to argue against this? You with me there? Contextually, exegetically, how are you going to argue against this? In other words, just like you cannot deny that God is a person, which is why you can lie to him, and the apostles are persons, albeit human persons, not divine persons, which is why you can lie to them, the Holy Spirit is a person as well because he can be lied to as well. There's no way around this contextually, exegetically, if you're going to be honest. If you're going to be honest. Okay? Okay. Now, Acts 5, verse 9. No, I can't explain Leviticus in five minutes. The theme of Leviticus is holiness. That without holiness, you cannot approach God. If you are in sin, then those sins must be covered, atoned for. Otherwise, you'll be cut off from the presence of God. So the entire theme of Leviticus is holiness unto Jehovah. Without holiness, you cannot dwell in God's presence. God is holy and requires his people to be holy in order to have fellowship with him. Okay? Acts 5, verse 9. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed to, together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Last time I checked, you don't tempt electricity. You don't tempt water. You don't tempt active forces. You only tempt individuals, persons who can be tempted. 
And here it says, Sapphira tempted the spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Right? You catch it there? I'll give you the final example. We'll talk about other issues. I'll give you the final example. We'll talk about other issues. Acts 15, 28 to 29. Yeah, you, you make sense, Larry boy. Yeah, but don't get into capitalization because that's an English feature. Acts 15, 20 to 29. The oldest Greek manuscripts are in unseals or unsiles, meaning majuscules. They're all capital letters, no spaces. Okay, Acts 15, 20 to 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. Did you catch it? It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to, uh, to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered titles and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. Now, did you catch it? Did you catch it? It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to the, to the apostles and elders. Now notice, for something to seem good to a specific entity, that requires discernment, that the entity must be discerning. But to be discerning, that means you have to have cognition, cognizance. Awareness, intellect, wisdom to discern this is good, this is not good, right? Are you with me there? Are you doing 1611? Are you with me there? Okay, but it says it seemed good to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and us. How can anything seem good to the Holy Spirit if the Holy Spirit doesn't have the ability to discern? But for him to have the ability to discern, the Holy Spirit has to have a mind, cognition, cognizance, right? And notice, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to the apostles and elders. No one's going to deny that the apostles and elders are persons who can discern. Then on what grounds contextually can you deny that of the Holy Spirit? It's the same context, right? Same context, right? Everyone with me there? Okay, now, Romans 8, 26, 27. And then we're going to segue into another topic. Romans 8, 26 to 27. This one I love. This one is very powerful. Romans 8, 26 to 27. Okay, read with me. L likewise, guys, pay attention here. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. The Spirit helps us in our infirmities, weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for, as you have, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. How can the Holy Spirit intercede for us, intercede in accord with our needs, and even groan as He's interceding for us if He doesn't have cognition, if He doesn't have awareness? If he doesn't have a mind to know how to pray for you and what to pray for. Are you with me there? But now read 27. Read 27. This is the key. 27, folks. And he that searches the hearts, meaning God the Father, that searches the hearts, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. How can God know the mind of the Spirit if the Spirit is his active force and doesn't have a mind? Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. How can God know the mind of the Spirit, and how can the Spirit know what the will of God is in order to pray in accord with God's will? Because that means that the Holy Spirit has to know what God's will is, has to be aware of God's will, has to know how to pray in accord with God's will, all of which requires a divine mind, which makes sense because it says God knows the mind of the Spirit. Clear? First Corinthians 12 verse 11. Now I can make a, a a much more thorough case, but this will suffice for now. First Corinthians 12 verse 11. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man sev severally as he will. Did you catch it? In First Corinthians 12, Paul is talking about the different gifts 
that the Holy Spirit distributes to the different members of the body of Christ. He's saying it is the Spirit who wills, who de decides what gift to give to which, which person. The Spirit decides that for you. In other words, I can be seeking the gift of tongues, and the Spirit says, no, that's not the gift for you. The gift I have for you is the gift of teaching. In other words, you can pray for a gift, but the Holy Spirit may have another gift in mind for you, one that you're not seeking. So this tells you it is the Holy Spirit who gives you the gifts that he wants you to have. And that word will, notice what it says, but all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. How can the Holy Spirit choose what gift a person will receive? Because the word will means as he decides, as he wills, as he decides if he's not a person. In fact, this very Greek word, will, the Holy Spirit will, wills, decides, is used of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's used of the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 10, 22. Okay, Luke 10, 22. Same Greek word used for the Holy Spirit, willing, deciding, choosing, is used of the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 10, 22. Let's look at it. Okay. Yeah. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Will reveal him. Same Greek word. It's the Son who decides, who chooses to reveal God to whomever he's pleased to. Same word used of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit decides and chooses what gifts each member of the body of Christ shall receive. Now, since no one's going to deny... That the Holy Spirit, the whole, sorry, the Son is a person. He's a divine person who took on a human nature, which is why he can choose, make choices, make decisions, and decide. Then why would you deny the same is true of the Holy Spirit when the same word is used of the Holy Spirit and his activity? Right? We're still waiting for you, Mark Cyril, you coward. You coward. I know you're going to run between your tails between your legs. Okay, you guys can hear me, right? Who are you talking to, Shimuni? And I just refuted you. You must be smoking crack because you didn't refute anything, you just got pwned. Yeah, send flat earth to the flat earth Sheol, where his father belongs. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now Mark Cyril won't show up. He wants to do a hit and run. Like that's why I kept saying he belongs to his father, the devil, and he's not a true Christian. He even said Jesus is my father, a modalist heretic. And when I called him up for that, oh, I didn't mean it that way. Yeah. All right. Doesn't even know how to address Jesus, just like he doesn't know how to interpret scripture. Okay, now, with that said, I gave you examples in which the Holy Spirit is identified as a person along with other persons, showing that it's not simply personification, because they'll often appeal to this literary feature device called personification. Because in certain what they call sapiential books, wisdom books, poetic literature, wisdom literature like psalms or proverbs and so forth things that are not personal that are inanimate are personified and i don't mean to use technical terms to confuse people personification means that you take something that's not personal and describe it as if it's a person that's called personification All right well everybody that just tells you i don't do drugs but you must do drugs because you know that you don't smoke crack Good to know. I want to know. I want to know how you know that. All right. Okay. Understand what a personification is? Where you take something that's not personal and then address it as if it's a person. Describe it as if it's a person. And that's what they'll say. Well, the Holy Spirit's being personified. No, that won't work because he's described as having personal traits in the same context where there are other persons involved. In fact, joining the Spirit in carrying out specific tasks. So personification will not work. 
Not only that, the Holy Spirit is described as a person in all the different literary genres of the Bible. It's not just wisdom literature. It's in the historical narrative. It's in the biographies of the life of Jesus. It's in the didactic portions of Scripture, the Scriptures that focus on teaching Christians their faith. So that won't work, right? Yes, actually, Stacy, it will help you tremendously with Joe's witnesses because they're going to try to explain it away as personification. But the examples I gave you, they can't explain it away. Moreover, one final point I want to address. They'll say, well, sometimes the Holy Spirit is likened to God's power. The Holy Spirit is described as the power of God. So if it's the power of God, then the power of God is not personal, right? So it must be impersonal, right? That's one of their arguments. With me there? Yep, another dog we have to muzzle. Down, boy, Larry. Down, girl. Okay. Let me show you why even calling the Holy Spirit power doesn't depersonalize the Holy Spirit. Even if he's called power or likened to power, that doesn't mean he's not a person. Are you guys ready for the refutation of that? Because if you're going to use this argument consistently, then you're going to have to deny the Father is a person and the Son is a person. Because let's go to Mark 14, 62. I hope I'm not boring you with this. I hope this is blessing you, educating you. Mark 14, 62. Exactly, Roland. Mark 14, 62. Read with me. Jesus speaking. And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. Did you guys catch it? Jesus sits at the right hand of power, the right hand of power. Number one, I didn't know power has a right hand, even though it's metaphorical. But number two, the power that he's referring to is the Father. So Jesus just called God the Father power, the right hand of power, meaning God the Father. So that means the Father cannot be a person because he's called power. Anthony Becker, I have no idea what you're smoking. When he said it's not separate from his personality, if you mean that he is one with the Father, and yes, if you mean he's not a person distinct from the Father, who hears from the Father, then you're another heretic who's going to get condemned and sent on his merry way. Okay? So I hope you're not stupid enough to challenge me. Okay? Did you guys catch it? Jesus sits at the right hand of power. Then you are. All right, you want me to muzzle you real quickly and show you one passage you can't answer so I can send you on your merry way? Okay, now watch how I'm going to muzzle this guy, this dog. Down, boy. Okay, Romans 8, 27. Watch here. Guys, watch here. Romans 8, 27. No, no, I'm stooping to your level. You're a dog and I'm coming to your level, making sure that you swallow your vomit. Okay, read with me, Anthony Becker. Come on, girl. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Now, Anthony Becker, how can the Father know the mind of the Spirit if the Spirit is not a distinct person from the Father? How can the Father know the mind of the Spirit? Then it says the Spirit prays in accord with the will of God. How does the Spirit know what the will of God is? And how does God know the mind of the Spirit if the Spirit is not personally distinct from the Father? Oh, so now notice how stupid this guy is. So let me now translate it according to this heretic's interpretation god the father knows his own mind <clears throat> because he is the spirit in a different manifestation and the spirit knows the will of god the father because the spirit is simply god the father in a different mode you see how stupid you are you see why i said it's going to take me less than five minutes to muzzle you okay girl dear dear girl i had a girl <laughs> send them on his merry way okay don't waste some our time anymore. I will not entertain heretics and cultists who are here to try to attack scripture. I will entertain sincere questions from those who don't believe like me if they're asking sincerely to learn. Right? Here's my policy. Even if you're an anti-Trinitarian, you're more than welcome to stay in my room if you have sincere questions that you want me to answer. You come here and try to pervert scripture, you're not going to last long. You know that. I'm sorry. Okay. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Okay. Now, with that said, hold on. Yeah, this guy didn't show up. Yep, he didn't show up. Okay. 
Yep. Yeah, this coward didn't show up. He comes in another name and he doesn't show up. And he wonders why I block him. Guys, you guys are on the record, right? I am blocked Mark Cyril. And I invited the dog to come and bark and defend his his garbage, but he never showed up. Okay. You guys are the witnesses to that. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Now I want to deal with Romans 8:16 because he brought it up to try to prove that the Holy Spirit is not given to anyone but human believers, okay? Let's deal with that because, again, I was hoping he'd show up so I could really humiliate him and enjoy every minute of it because I just love to punish people, heretics and sons of Satan. But anyway, are you ready? Okay. Romans 8, 16. In his long rant, his long-winded rant that butchered Scripture to his shame and destruction, he says the, the spirit is only given to human believers. That's the gist of his arguments. Romans 8, 16. Are you, are you listening? Romans 8, 16. Okay. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the Holy Spirit is only given to the children of God. They're human beings. So therefore, I'm wrong to say the Holy Spirit right, is given to animals, even though that pretty much shows he didn't understand what he was refuting. But let me show you what he did not do. Are you ready? What he did not do. And this is why I have no respect for such people. He stops at 16, but he didn't read 17 to 25. Is it true that God only sends Holy Spirit to regenerate human beings to become children of God? Or does the Holy Spirit animate all creation and even recreates the earth and all that's within it, meaning even animals? Let's see. Let's continue reading where he left off, right? Larry Boy, you're back barking again? Down Boy, come here, girl. Atta girl, send Larry Boy on his way. Mm -hmm. Sorry, girl, I got a little snacky for you. Mm -hmm. All right, Romans 8, 17 to 25. Let's look at it. Read with me as Protestant believer, post. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, so if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Guys, read with me. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Guys, pay attention. Sons of God one side, creation on another. Pay attention. For the, for the creature, meaning creation, was made subject to vanity, to decay, to corruption, to pollution. Not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered. Guys, pay attention, please. Please pay attention. Verse 21. The creation will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only that, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, right? <clears throat> Grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. It's realized. You don't have to hope for it anymore. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Okay? Now, did you guys pay attention? Pay attention. Creation and believers are all awaiting the glorious redemption from their corruption at God's appointed time. Creation will be redeemed from its corruption, made incorruptible, like our bodies will be made incorruptible. Did you guys catch it? Not just human believers, but creation, right? You guys caught it? Okay, did everyone catch it before I move on to the next point? Question, if it's the Holy Spirit that redeems our bodies from corruption, if it's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, that transforms our bodies, making it incorruptible, who do you think will be the one that will take this corrupt creation that's decaying, that's tainted, and then transform it to become incorruptible? Who do you think is going to do that? Who's going to do that? Who's going to do that work? Who's going to do that work? Come on, guys. The Holy Spirit, right? Follow-up question. When it says the creation, 
has been subjected to fu vanity, futility, and it eagerly awaits its uh, freedom from bondage to corruption. When he talks about creation, is he talking about the earth and everything in it? Is he talking about the earth and everything in it? But wait, last time I checked, animals are on the earth. Last time I checked, you have marine life, plant life. You have <clears throat> the fall of the air. So wait, you're saying that according to Romans 8, if you read all the way to 25, not stop at 16, Paul says everything in creation, obviously unbelievers will be cut off, unbelievers will be severed because they refuse to turn to Christ, but believers and the creation, meaning the earth, the plantation, the trees, the flowers, the insects, the animals, the beasts, the fowls of the air, the sea life, all of that subjected to corruption will then be redeemed and made incorruptible? And this dog, Mark Searle, wanted to use that passage to refute me. But now let me show you that it is the Holy Spirit that will transform creation, the earth and everything in it, making it incorruptible. That, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Psalm 104, 29 to 30. Yeah. Here goes the son of Satan again under another name. Send Fahrenheit on his merry way. Okay. Psalm 104, 29 to 30. Let's read. Guys, read with me. And I'm going to unpack John 1.18. Georgia the Greek, please stop quoting the same passage over and over again. You're going to get blocked too. Psalm 104, 104.29.30. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, ruach, the Hebrews ruach. They die and return to their dust. So when God takes away the breath of man, the spirit of man, he returns to the dust. But now notice Psalm 104.30. Psalm 104.30. Guys, pay attention. Psalm 104.30. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. Did you catch it? When God wants to recreate the dead, resurrect them, he sends the Holy Spirit to recreate them, but he also sends the Holy Spirit to renew the face of the earth, to restore the face of the earth, to replenish the face of the earth. So, Mark Cyril, you barking, rabby dog. What was that about Romans 8, 16? No wonder you didn't want to show up. Okay. Isaiah 32, 14 and 15. Isaiah 32, 14 and 15. So, does this not prove that the Holy Spirit animates even animals, sustains even animals, gives life even to animals, and will restore animals and make animals incorruptible? I've already challenged Rabbi Tovia, your master, your dog, to a debate, to debate me and Michael Brown, and he runs like your prophet did when Jesus buried him in hell. Okay? So Isaiah 32, 14 and 15. Guys, pay attention. Isaiah 32, 14 and 15. Because the palaces shall be forsaken, the multitude of the city shall be left, the forts and towers shall be for dens forever, a joy of wild asses, a pasture of flocks. Now watch 15. Pay attention to 15. Until the Spirit be poured up, poured upon us from on high, the Spirit will be poured upon us on earth, and the wilderness will be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. Wow. Wait, wait, wait. When God wants to restore the land, a parched land, a desert land, and make it plush with life, with fruits, vegetation, and restore human beings, how does he do it? Pouring out the Holy Spirit, huh? Hmm. But wait, in that context, didn't it also mention animals? So what was that about Romans 8, 16? No, actually, Tobias Singer would decimate James White in a debate on the Old Testament. I'm sorry, Mike Roth, but that's the truth. James White is very weak when it comes to the Old Testament. Michael Brown is the expert. So you see why that dog, Mark Searle, was too afraid to show up. So he wants to do a hit and run. Now, hopefully, he'll show up in a future session so I can destroy the rest of his shameless perversion of Scripture. Right? If not, I'll continue to humiliate him for not being humble and calling me a coward. Okay? 
Okay, so glory to God. Have you been blessed thus far? Azo, don't ask me a question that you don't want a sincere answer to. I'm going to block you because you're not asking sincerely. When you mention Toby Singer, you're a joke. And I don't answer questions for jokes who are sent by Satan to distract. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. If you're now, let's go to John 118. If you're ready now for God not being seen. Hold on about the one second. Are you ready for that? All right, hold on a second. Let's go to John 118. Let's unpack it. I'm going to have to change the title. All right. I'm going to have to change the title. Sorry, excuse me. Okay, we're going to have to do it. Okay, John 118. Are you ready now? Can God the Father be seen? Can God the Father be seen? No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. People quote this passage to try to prove, see, God the Father cannot be seen. So that's why if you see God, that's Jesus Christ, our Lord. No, I'm Assyrian. Assyrian. Okay. Let's look at another one. John 5, 37. Let me get John 5, 37 out of the way. John 5, 37 out of the way. And then we'll focus on John 1.18 and John 6.46. Yeah. Well, even when you say face, neither the Father nor the Son nor the Holy Spirit, in respect to their divine nature, Lopez, have an actual face. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in relation to their deity as God, they are bodiless and corporeal. So even when we say face, what does that mean? As I explain in brief... It means that Moses was asking to see God, a more fuller expression of God's visible glory, akin to the way the angels see God in heaven. My understanding is that Moses wanted to see God's visible form in the same fullness that the angels behold it in heaven. You with me there? Uh, Mike Roth. Do not comment. I'm going to block you. He can be seen by human eyes in the natural. Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 5. Verse 5, Isaiah says, My eyes have seen the King, Jehovah of hosts. Isaiah 6, verse 5. He says, My eyes have seen the King, Jehovah of hosts. And those are his natural eyes. Do not pontificate. You're going to get blocked, Mike Roth. Listen and learn or go somewhere else. Okay. John 5.37. John 5.37. Let's read it. John 5.37. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Now pay attention to what our Lord Jesus says. Ye have neither heard his voice. You that I'm speaking to have not heard his voice at any time nor seen a shape. Implication, folks. Two implications of Jesus' words. God has a voice that can be heard and has a shape that can be seen. Do you catch it? You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Do you guys catch it? Jesus' words imply that just as God has a voice that can be heard, he has a shape that can be seen. God the Father. When I say God, obviously the Father, right? Do you see it now? I want it to settle in. So does the Father assume a shape or has a shape that can be seen? Yes, just like he has a voice that can be heard. So is Jesus saying that though he has a voice and a shape, no one can hear the voice or see the shape at any time? No. Notice what he just said. You have never heard his voice. But hold on, Jesus. If that means no one at any time can hear the voice of the Father audibly, then there's a contradiction. Because let's go to John 12, 28 to 30. John 12, 28 to 30. Almost done. I can't be too loud. They're going to go to sleep. John 12, 28 to 30. Watch here. Okay. Jesus speaking. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven. Guys, pay attention. 
Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, the people heard it, right, said that it thundered. It sounded like thunder. Others said an angel spake to him. Now notice what our Lord says in verse 30. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Oh, guys, did you catch it? Amazing. Jesus speaks to the Father, Father, glorify your name, and then the Father speaks audibly in a voice that people, believer, unbeliever, hears. But I thought no one could hear the voice of the God the Father. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Buffering. Yep. Okay. Did you hear it? Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. And a voice is heard audibly, loudly, that believer, unbeliever hears it. But I thought Jesus said in John 5, 37, no one can hear the Father's voice. Is that what he said? No, he didn't say that. He didn't say no one can hear the Father's voice. He was talking to the unbelievers saying, you unbelievers have never heard his voice. You have never heard his voice. He didn't say no one has ever heard his voice. You see the misinterpretation of John 5, 37? But let me show you other places where people saw the Father appear in a visible form and heard his voice. Matthew 17, verse 5. Matthew 17, verse 5. Exactly. Matthew 17, verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Oh, so they saw something visible, a cloud coming on top of them. A visible cloud coming on top of them. Okay. Overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Wait, wait, wait. Peter, James, and John saw a cloud, visible cloud. And in that cloud was the father. That cloud came on top of them, and then they heard a voice audibly commanding them to obey the son he loves. So they heard the father's voice, and the father appeared in a cloud. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. Okay, hold on one second. So about that. Second Peter chapter one, verses sixteen to eighteen. Okay. Read with me. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. We didn't make up stories and fables to deceive you and lie to you, like Muhammad and his God did. When we had made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw his glory. We saw it. We saw it. We were there. We experienced it. Notice 1718. Guys, pay attention, 1718. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. A voice came to the Son. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Hmm. The apostles say they heard the voice of the Father audibly and they saw a cloud. <clears throat> which represented the Father's presence coming down on them. Jesus in John 12 says, Father, glorify your name, and a voice is heard audibly to believer and unbeliever alike. But then John 5, 37 says, you have never heard his voice nor seen a shape. Let's look at John 5, 37. Now we know what it doesn't mean. All right? Now we know what it doesn't mean. John 5, 37. And the Father himself, which has sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor has seen a shape. Number one, we see it cannot mean that no one has ever heard the Father's voice, right? Because I just gave you several examples. They heard the Father's voice audibly. Number two, implication. Just like the Father has a voice that can be heard, he also has a shape that can be seen. 
you can't separate the one from the other. Did you catch it? Jesus says, your, his voice you haven't heard, his shape you haven't seen. But wait, if God has an actual voice that can be heard, that means he must have a shape or assumes a shape that can be seen. But I thought the Father can never be seen. Wow. You see how many traditions of men you've bought into and I bought into that we thought are scriptural but are perversions of scripture? I have no idea, Professor, to you, Smith. I have no idea. I know I was taught it and I blindly followed it. Johnson Pro, I don't know if you're asking sincerely because we've answered that question 10 billion times on my channel, on the website, in my articles, and with David Wood. Okay? All right. Okay, now, now that we got that out of the way, let's go to John 118. John 118. No, also, Michael or Michaela, God was seen and heard by unbelievers, the nation of Israel and the Egyptians. When they saw a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, the Egyptians saw it and they knew in that cloud was God. So though they didn't see the visible shape of the one in the cloud, they knew that was Jehovah, right? So anyway, John 118. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Okay, here, guys. Let me ask you a question. Is John saying no one has seen God with the human eye, seen God visibly? Or is John saying no one has seen God with the mind's eye, meaning seen in the sense of understood and perceived? In other words, is John saying no one has perceived the nature of God, what God is like? Or is he saying no one has actually seen God with his eyes in visible form? For example, if I say to Lopez, do you see my point? And he says, yeah, I see your point. What do I mean, do you see my point? Exactly, like 1611. You see what I mean? You see what I mean? I'm not saying, do you see it visibly, that my point is 5 foot 10 inches, 200 pounds. I'm saying, do you perceive and understand? Do you see with your mind's eye? Exactly, like see what I mean. To prove to you that the word seen can mean see with the mind, perceive with the mind, understand with the mind. Here's the link to the Greek. Okay? Here's the link to the Greek. And I'm going to prove to you it's not saying see God visibly. Okay, click on it. Click on that. I'm going to walk you through this. There's that word for has seen. I'm going to click on it for you. The Erasmian pronunciation. Okay, here you go. Here's the link, so you don't take my word for it, okay? See what I'm saying? Exactly. Click on that. When you click on it, you're going to click on Strong's Greek 3708. Horao. Horao or horao, if you want to say with the breathing sound, okay? Here it goes. Don't take my word for it, okay? Click on it. You're going to see it says horao or horao to see, perceive. Attend to, usage, I see, look upon, experience, perceive, discern, beware. Helps word studies. Horao. Properly, see often with metaphorical meaning, to see with the mind. Spiritually see, perceive with inward spiritual perception. You guys see it? See, I even said it. Do you guys see it? And I mean see it both with your eyes and understand. Okay, you guys got it? Uh, Michaelia, why am I going to quote the Hebrew when John is written in Greek? What are you talking about? Stop with the distractions and listen. Okay, so is John saying no one can see God the Father or God with the human eye, meaning visibly, or he means no one at any time has perceived God, seen him with the mind, and understood him apart from the revelation of the Son? Let me prove to you it means no one has understood God, perceived God, Apart from the revelation of the Son. Let's go back to John 118. The Greek. Here it goes. I want you to I want you to go 
and look at what the Greek word is. For no one has seen God any time, but the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, hath declared him. Click on it, and you're going to see what the Greek word is. Exi gisatu. Exi gisatu. Do you see that word, exi gisatu? Rasmian butchering of the Greek. It's exi gisatu. Do you see it? Yeah. Do you see it? Guys, click on it. See, do you see the word exi gisatu? Exi gisatu? You know, that word is where we get the word exegesis. This is the Greek word from where we get the English exegesis. Exegete. Exegesis. So you know what John is saying? No one has perceived, understood the nature of God, seen God with the mind, except the Son who exegetes him, who interprets him, who explains him. So what more proof do you need that John 1.18 is not saying God the Father cannot be seen visibly? God the Father cannot be seen visibly. It's saying no one has understood the nature of God, the being of God, apart from the Son, explaining the nature of God to us. You want me there? See, Bender, you're letting this guy distract you with talk about gay when it's not the topic. I'm going to block both of you if you don't stop. So let me now translate John 118. And I don't know why the admins are letting these guys just rock, run amok. I should probably even ban the admins. Okay. Let me now explain John 118. The point of John. No one has understood, perceived what God is like, the nature of God, except by the revelation of the Son, because it's the Son who explains God to us and helps us understand what God is like. You catch it now? So will you ever misquote John 118, misuse John 118 to prove that God the Father cannot be seen? Come on, admins, get rid of these demons. Ah, uh, Devlin. Yep, son of the devil. Okay. Will you guys ever misquote John 118 to try to prove that God the Father cannot be seen? Well, that's not the point of John 118. Yes, they are because, Michelle, they're angry because we're glorifying the triune God and the power of the Holy Spirit. We're speaking truth and the enemies are getting angry, but we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Okay. Did you guys get it now? Did you understand the point of John 118 before I move on? Did you understand the point of John 118? So, will you now promise me to never misquote John 118 to make it say something it doesn't say that no one can see God the Father? So when they saw God in the Old Testament, it was God the Son. Yeah, smash, hit that like button. We have over 100. We should have over 100 likes. Right? I don't know if I'm too loud. We got to finish up, man. Is that clear? You guys are with me there. You will never misquote John 118, right? Okay. What about John 6, 44, 46? What about this passage? And then I'm going to deal with another one in another session. Not today. John 6, 4, 4, chapter 4. Ch chapter 6 was 44 to 46. This is another one that's misquoted. Okay. Okay, let's read that, and I'll get this out of the way, and we're done. John 6, 44, 46. Now, guys, read with me. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, pay attention. 45 and 46. Pay attention. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Notice what the context is. Being taught of God, who God is. God teaching you about who he is. Every man, therefore, that hath heard, and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Guys, pay attention to what the context is. Being taught of God about God. Learning from God. Right? Learning about the Father. Being taught about who the Father is, right? 
It's about knowledge, knowing, learning, teaching. So now, verse 46. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. So let me read 45 again. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. You want to learn about the Father? You want to be taught of the Father? You got to come to me. And here's why. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Once again, is he saying, see with the visible eye? Guess what the Greek word is again, folks? It's the same word. I gave you the link as in John 118. It's the same word that comes from horao. Horao. It's the same word. And we saw that horao doesn't necessarily mean see with the human eye. It means see with the mind, perceive with the mind. Here it is. Here's proof. Here is proof. Let me show it to you. Here is proof. There you go. What does it mean to see, perceive, attend to? I see, look upon, experience, perceive, discern, beware. Helps word studies. Horao, properly, see, often with metaphorical meaning, to see with the mind. And if you actually look at theirs, the entry for seeing with the mind, with the mind's eye, it lists John 118, John 646 under that metaphorical meaning. Perceive with inward spiritual perception. So this is not Jesus saying, you cannot see God the Father visibly. This is what he's saying. Let me explain what he's saying. This is what he's saying. No one has understood what the Father's like. No one has perceived what the Father is like. I alone know the Father. I alone perceive his nature and fully comprehend his nature, which is why the Father brings me brings you to me, because I alone am qualified to tell you and teach you about the Father perfectly. If I alone perceive the Father's nature, nature and fully comprehend his nature, then who is more qualified than me to teach you about the Father properly? You understand his point? His point isn't no one can see the Father visibly. His point is no one can know who the Father is, perceive the nature of the Father, see what the Father is like, unless the Son, who fully comprehends the Father, perfectly understands the Father, knows the Father inside and out, inside and out makes Him known to you. That's what it means. You need the Son to know the Father, understand the Father, perceive the Father, and also, you need the Son to see the Father visibly because the Father makes Himself known through the Son and He will not make Himself known apart from the Son. If you want the gist of John 6, what John 6 means, it's Luke 10, 22. That's right. Lopez, drop the mic. Luke 10, 22. If you want to capture... What Jesus is saying in John 6, 44, 46, it's Luke 10, 22. Yep, through the Holy Spirit. Okay. Luke 10, 22. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father. There you go. And who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Bam. That's all John 6 is saying. No one can know my Father and no one can know me because the Father and I are incomprehensible beyond your ability to fully comprehend. And no one can know me except the Father because it requires an infinite mind to fully comprehend me. And I alone can comprehend the Father, which means that the Son is claiming, I too am omniscient. I have an infinite mind, which is why I can perfectly comprehend the Father in the same way he perfectly comprehends me. And since no one knows me except the Father, and no one knows the Father except me, that means you need to come to me if you want to know God. Because there's no one qualified to make God known to you except me. And I do so in union with the Holy Spirit. Yep, well, I'm done right now, my last point. Let's end it with 1 John 5.20. And Lord willing, I'll, I'll address a final passage in the future. 1 Timothy 6. 15, 16, which is also misquoted and applied to the Father incorrectly when it's a, it's about the Son. I'll do that in another session. Here is the point of John in a nutshell. First John 5, 20. 
Here it is. And we know that the Son of God, here you go. Here it goes. Here it goes, folks. Here's the answer, Lopez. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. That's what it means. The Son of God came so he can help us understand what God is like, perceive what God is like, and know God truly and fall in love with him. That's all it means. So, folks, never, never, never misquote John 1.18 or John 6.46 or Exodus 33.20 to make it say something it does not say. None of those passages say God the Father cannot be seen visibly. God the Father does not assume a shape by which you can see him visibly. None of those passages are teaching that. And I've given you plenty of proof that God the Father assumes a shape, a visible form, in order to allow people to see him, but they only see him because of the grace of Jesus, because of the revelation of Christ. So even when they see the Father, they're seeing the Father because of the mediation of the Son. It's the Son who makes the Father, <clears throat> who gives us access to the Father, who allows us to see the Father, perceive the Father, and actually behold him. It's because of the Son, and he does it in union with the Holy Spirit. And I'll prove that in a future session, that the Holy Spirit is also involved in making the Father known on behalf of the Son who sends the Spirit to continue that revelation of who the Father is through the Son. Okay? That's the Trinity. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. Lord willing, I'll try to do a session this week. I return God willing Saturday to Chicago, but I need your prayers. Please pray and fast hard that God will give me a green light. The other state will give me a green light so I can leave in two weeks. Pray and fast hard that I will see my daughters. I haven't seen them since June. They'll be in my life, and I can raise them in the love of Jesus. Pray God will provide overabundantly financially for me to be on my feet and take care of them. So if God has put in your heart you want to partner financially, please do so. Pray God gives me the health I need and to be holy unto the Lord and glorify him, to continue to serve him till I die or until Christ returns. He doesn't need me. I need him. Hit the like button, subscribe, and pass this on to others. And then download these videos, use this information, and teach others for the glory of Christ. We love you, Lord Jesus. Wash us in your blood. Wash my daughters in your blood. Fill us with the Spirit and save us from the evil one. Save me from this corrupt system. In Jesus' name, amen. Take care, guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed.